September, uh, almost at the end of 2020. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce our speakers for this morning. We have an all-star cast. Uh, and if I spent the time to actually give you all of their background and areas of expertise, I think we wouldn't leave enough time for the presentation itself. So I'm just gonna go through uh, the highlights of each of the presenters um, and they will obviously introduce themselves as they start, they're gonna do a bit of a tag team. We're gonna be starting with Dr. Hugh McMillan. Hugh is a pediatric neurologist at CHEO, an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics and uh, has been program director for the Pediatric Neurology Residency Training Program. His clinical expertise is in inherited and, and acquired disorders of peripheral nerve, muscle, and neuromuscular junction. His research interests include clinical research, clinical trials, both investigator-initiated and sponsor-initiated studies, as well as translational research in cooperation with basic scientists. He is a member of the Muscular Dystrophy of Canada Scientific Advisory Board and chairperson of the Canadian Pediatric Neuromuscular Group. Our next presenter is Dr. Alex McKenzie, uh, who is well known to all. Alex, that, is a, leave it like that. That's great. <laughs> pediatrician at CHEO. He's conducted research on rare genetic diseases over the past 30 years and seems to have found a new home in the wastewaters of Ottawa uh, measuring COVID virus. Um, but today he's not going to be talking about that, right, Alex? Uh, maybe a little. Our third, our, third oh, no. present, our third presenter is Dr. Kristen Kernahan. Kristen is the lab head in Newborn Screening Ontario in the Molecular Laboratory. She is a clinical doctoral scientist in the Division of Metabolism and Newborn Screening in the Department of Pediatrics at CHEO and assistant professor in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Ottawa. Kristen completed her, uh, on her um, honors specialization in genetics and PhD in biochemistry at the University of Western Ontario. Uh, she then completed a postdoctoral fellowship with Care for Rare and, and acquired her CCMG training at CHEO before joining NSO in 2018. Her research interests include the identification of new, new disease genes and development of new molecular genetic technologies for diagnostics and screening. And our final presenter is Dr. Pranesh Chakraborty. Pranesh is a medical and laboratory director of Newborn Screening Ontario. He's a physician in the Division of Metabolism newborns and Newborn Screening in the Department of Pediatrics and an associate professor in the Faculty of Medicine at University of Ottawa with cross appointment to the Department of BMI. Pranesh was certified by the Royal College of Medical Biochemistry and Pediatrics with subspecialty in, bio, in biomedical genetics. He led the transition of Ontario's newborn screening program to, uh, to Ottawa leading to the establishment of Newborn Screening Ontario, NSO as we know it today. And he is an advisor to ministry as senior medical consultant. He co-leads the Canadian Inherited Metabolic Diseases Research Network with Beth Potter at Ottawa at U Ottawa and uh, supervises graduate and undergraduate students in a metabol metabolomics research program. Today, they are gonna be speaking to us about newborn screening for spinal muscular atrophy and we'll end with some exciting uh, announcements. So I will hand it over to Dr. He McMillan who's gonna lead off the presentation. Please give a virtual welcome to all of our presenters. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mona. I, I appreciate that. So I've just shared my screen. Uh, please let me know if there's any, if you can't see it, but uh, we'll be speaking over the next 45 minutes about newborn screening for SMA. And what we'll cover is uh, each of us will tackle one of these objectives. I'll provide um, an overview of clinical presentations, treatments, and I'll start with the case. Uh, Alex will talk about the pathobiology of SMA. Kristen will talk about SMA newborn screening, the test itself and the process. And then Pranish will talk a bit more generally about principles of newborn screening and the experience that we have to date in Ontario. So I'll start with a case. And um, this is a child that I first met when he was 11 days old. And this was the first child that was identified to have SMA pre-symptomatically through the Ontario Newborn Screening Pilot Project. He screened positive at 10 days of life. I met him the following day. And very quickly, we were able to um, obtain confirmatory genetic testing here at CHEO that confirmed that this boy did have um, the genetics that were predictive of, of SMA type 2. And we'll talk more about what I mean by that predictive part in a bit. 
He had zero SMN1 gene copies and he had three SMN2 gene copies. So in a newborn screening program, the, the goal is really to initiate treatment um, as quickly as possible to try to preempt the onset of symptoms. This boy was treated with uh, nusinersen at 24 days of life. We were able to get approval from the Ontario EAP program um, and treat him. And then we're also very fortunate in that he was selected through the uh, Avexis Novartis Managed Access Program, and he was dosed with Zolgensma, which is a gene replacement therapy we'll talk about, at 37 days of life. And then after that, because of the nature of that treatment, no other ongoing treatment was necessary for this boy. And at his last assessment by our neuromuscular physiotherapist, Catherine Lacroix, at 10 months of age, he is completely normal with regards to his strength and his development. His Alberta Infant Motor Scale, which looks at gross motor development, puts him at the 25th to 50th percentile, so solidly within the normal range. Now, if we look at the genetics of SMA, we see on the left the normal situation where there's two functional copies of SMN1, which stands for the survival motor neuron one gene. In the middle, we see the situation where an individual is a carrier, an, an asymptomatic carrier, because we only need one copy to function in order to be completely normal. We see that in one out of 50 people. So I would predict that at least one of us on this Zoom call is likely to be a carrier for SMA. And on the right, we see the situation where an individual is affected with SMA. They are missing two copies of their SMN1 gene. Both alleles are affected. And we see this in approximately one out of 10,000 live births. And SMA, in fact, has become the most common cause of death in childhood due to a genetic cause. It replaced cystic fibrosis, in part because of some of the excellent care and treatments that have been given to children with CF, and SMA now has that infamous title. Looking again at the genetics in the normal situation, we see that if there is an SMN1 copy, there's um, mRNA that is produced and then SMN protein that's translated more than enough to keep our motor neurons and our motor nerves alive. In this instance, the second gene, SMN2, which is a pseudogene, and each copy of SMN2 produces about 10% of the SMN protein that we would predict be produced from one functional copy of the SMN1 gene. So in the normal situation, it really doesn't matter how many SMN2 copies we have. But if an individual has SMA and they're missing both copies of their SMN1, then the number of SMN2 copies becomes critically important because if we have multiple copies of SMN2, then we would predict that there would be a higher quantity, a greater amount of SMN protein that's produced. And that gives rise to a disease modifying effect for children who have SMA. Historically, we've classified these children into three main types, type one, type two, and type three. And historically, they've been classified according to the maximum milestone that those children achieve, as well as the time of symptom onset. We also know that the SMN2 copy number does have a role. So we can offer some predictive value when we know the number of SMN2 copy numbers, how severe the phenotype might be. But we have to note that it's not a guarantee and it's not a 100% correlation. Children who have three copies, for example, um, could have the milder or even the more severe forms of SMA. So it's a guide, but it's not an absolute association. If we look at the survival for infants who historically have shown symptom onset before six months, infants with type one SMA, there's two excellent studies that were carried out in the United States that show us the mean survival for children who have SMA type one and two copies of SMN2 as indicated in that black line on the Kaplan-Meier curve. The mean survival of 50% of those children is um, 10 and a half months. And the vast majority of children with type 1 SMA will not survive beyond their second birthday. <laughs>
And as a consequence of that, there's been a huge focus on treatments. And there's really two main categories of treatments that I will talk about quickly. On the left, we're seeing treatments where um, they alter the splicing of the SMN2. They make that gene um, do a better job of making SMN protein. There's one medication, nusinersen, that's been approved by Health Canada. There's another um, splicing modulator that's under review by Health Canada called Ristaplam. And the second strategy is to replace the missing SMN1 gene, as is the case with omnisamnagene abelparvivec, which is also currently under review by Health Canada. There's been a tremendous change. When I think back to 10 years ago, when I first started here at CHEO, there were no treatments available. And now we're facing a situation where there's potentially three treatments that are available in other countries and, and may soon also become available in Canada. Those treatments, as well as the potential to offer early or pre-symptomatic therapy, is dramatically changing the natural history of SMA. And in fact, the types that we used to use, type one, type two, type three, we are moving away from that. And there's now a greater consensus among neuromuscular experts to just to describe these children in terms of the milestones that they attain sitters, standers, and walkers. We're seeing children that formerly would have had type one that are now walking with, um, with early institution of treatment. Nusinersen, which is the only one of these three therapies that has been approved, is an antisense oligonucleotide, and it alters the splicing of mRNA of the SMN2 gene. As a consequence of that, there's a greater amount of SMN protein produced, it's administered through repeat intrathecal injections at a very set time frame. There's loading doses, and then maintenance will continue indefinitely every four months. Excellent data of pre-symptomatic treatment with nusinersen shows in this graph here, the timeline on the x-axis, and then a motor outcome score on the y-axis called the CHOP and 10 score. And that's a score to look at things babies do like roll, sit, show head control. A normal score would be 64 indicated by the hatched line and a normal child who did not have SMA would achieve that score at approximately three and a half months. Normally for children with type one SMA, they would never be above 40 on the CHOP and 10 score. We're seeing children who have two copies and three copies that were treated pre-symptomatically with nusinersen, showing a dramatic change relative to the natural history that would otherwise have been seen. And some of these children achieving normal develop and others approximating normal development. We also, when we look at key motor outcomes, such as ability to sit and ability to walk, we see in blue, those with two copies of SMN2, those in green, three copies of SMN2, and we're seeing all of these children are now being able to sit, many of them, but not all of them within the normal time range that's indicated by the hatched lines again. On the right, we're seeing most of the children with two copies being able to walk and all of the children with three copies being able to walk. Um, the ones who are the little triangles at the top in blue are those with SMN2 copies that did not achieve that milestone. So a dramatic change from natural history, not normal development, but very impressive motor development. Onisemnagene aboparvivec is not approved in Canada. It is approved in four other countries or jurisdictions. It's using an AAV9 vector to replace a cDNA that contains the missing SMN1 gene. It's administered as a one-time intravenous infusion it delivers that SMN1 transgene, and there's a continuous promoter that's attached to that. And then similar, similarly, although through a different mechanism, it allows for a greater production of SMN protein. That circular episome, as we can see as this purple circle with number four attached to it, will reside within the nucleus, but it's largely non-integrating and does not integrate into the um, the patient's DNA, which we see as represented in blue in that figure on the right. So it finds its way into the nucleus and it stays there, but largely does not integrate. 
if we look at the results from the pre-symptomatic trials with onisemnagine avoparvivec, we see on the left, again, the CHOP and 10 score. The gray zone is what we would expect as natural history data for children who have um, SMA type 1. And we see here for the children who have two copies of SMN2, again, largely predictive of type 1, each color is a different patient. All of them are surpassing the 40, which is the ceiling we would have expected without treatment. Some of them achieving normal CHOP and 10 scores, even at a normal time, and others, again, approximating it quite closely. On the right is showing the same data, but as a mean, as opposed to the individual data points. If we look again at those two key motor milestones, sitting independently and walking independently, we see in this particular slide, those with two SMN2 copies. One of the things we see here is all but one of these children with two copies of SMN2 were able to sit at an age appropriate time. There's also six infants that are documented by little circles who have not yet achieved the ability to sit, but are still within the time zone that they may be able to acquire that skill. Similarly with walking, four of these children who otherwise would have been predicted to have SMA type one are walking independently, the others still too young for us to know for sure. For the three copy patients, we're seeing a very similar profile with patients sitting or walking and in this particular slide, the vast majority is still too young to be able to say for sure. There has been additional data that's been produced from this study and will be available um, in the near future as these children are getting older and achieving more milestones. The other third therapy that I'll mention, again, not approved in Canada, is an oral medication, a liquid, that also alters the splicing of mRNA. This is a small molecule. It is not an antisense oligonucleotide, but analogous to what we see with nusinersen, it also improves and increases the amount of SMN protein that's produced. This is a daily medication, again, taken by mouth or G2. And there's results that have been released from the sunfish study, the firefish study, looking at children with symptomatic SMA type one and older children, and hopefully soon we'll have the results from their rainbow fish study that is also looking pre-symptomatic at infants um, who have SMA. So with that, I'm going to stop and I'm going to uh, stop sharing and turn things over to um, Alex. Okay. All right. Th thank you very much, uh, Hugh. Uh, so this is um, share. This is an example of why we don't uh, here we go, share this one. Uh, so, so thank you, people. Uh, th this is, um, uh, that was a very good uh, introduction. Actually, that was actually almost the punchline. Um, uh, can people see, uh, okay, so now we talk, heard about Picasso's blue period. This is Mackenzie's blue period. Kim Boycott and Bob Cornelick make fun of these slides, but I like them. Anyway, so this is, this is uh, way back when, back 25 years ago in the old days, when we were studying SMA, we identified this region and started sequencing. We identified NAEP, which was homozygously deleted. The French, clever French, identified SMN1. They happen to be, a, what's the word, right? At any rate, we still think NAEP uh, actually might be involved in modulating a bit. And over here is the SMN2, the rescue copy. So unlike cystic fibrosis, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, this whole uh, area is just deleted in this repetitive area of chromosome five, leaving the SMN2 to carry the burden, as Hugh said. So fundamentally, the um, and I'm sorry I'm going so fast, I have six <laughs> minutes to explain why I think SMA happens. The SMN1 is deleted. The biochem, that's a genetic defect, the biochemical defect, just less protein, not completely no protein, because that's fatal. Basically, if you knock it out completely in the mouse where there's no SMN2, it kills the mouse. And in point of fact, it's an ancient, protein RNA involved in RNA metabolism. And human are the only species with SMN2. If you get rid of even the most primordial cell line, get rid of SMN, the cell line dies. So SMN2, even though it's a piece of genomic detritus and it's probably an accident, is what is the reason why we actually have SMA and it's not just a in utero fatal disorder. Anyway, the defect is SMN1, a reduction in the protein SMN. It is in the motor neuron. The motor neuron is a large complicated beast. And so where does it matter? Is it in the cell body? It's the SMN is made there. We know it's transported down the axon and it also goes to what they call the presynaptic area. 
uh, in front of the neuromuscular junction. So where, where, uh, when, and which function is involved. And so quickly, uh, Louise uh, um, Simard, a former chair of biochem at Winnipeg, a good friend early on showed it, uh, SMN. If you looked at a, a neuron, which is extending out a growth cone, there was a concentration of SMN to be found there where the white arrow is. Uh, Michael Sentner, another colleague in Germany showed when you make the SMA mice, he was the first to make the SMA mice, there, the growth cone, here's a motor neuron with a growth cone in a wild type mouse, normal mouse. Here's one in a mouse with SMA, and it is much smaller. The growth cone is much smaller. This is actually how much smaller it is, this histogram on the right. And in point of fact, when you look closely at SMA um, <clears throat> models in the mice, they've been very valuable. These are, the, uh, these are the axons leading down to the neuromuscular junctions, which are on top of the skeletal muscles. Healthy boutons is a rather sort of vain French terminology they use for this. One can see it very clearly. Whereas if you go over and look at the SMA mouse, chaos, uh, uh, the, the boutons are, are sort of not nearly as well developed and they're much smaller. So <clears throat> the smoking gun is pointing down towards this presynaptic area. Um, and th this quick uh, pivot here, uh, we see that even in the mildest forms of SMA, be it mice or men, mice, mice or uh, men and women, we should say, RDI, uh, uh, that basically it happens early. Here's a het mouse, one that just has 50% of the SMN, and it's within the first five weeks, as we can see this hideous orange and yellow, uh, there's a 28% reduction in motor neurons. And you go on to three months, six months, they don't lose much more. Similarly, Kathy Svoboda in Utah then showed that Type one, you lose your motor, this is the motor unit count here, you lose them quickly, but also type two and type three, that you lose them quickly, the damage ha happens early. So SMN, uh, um, motor neuron loss occurs early, even in the mild of SMA, and in a sense, it is not a progressive disease. People grow into their deficits, and we can have a philosophic uh, argument about this, but fundamentally, it, it happens early, uh, and, um, in keeping with this, Charlotte Sumner, Tom Crawford, and uh, uh, Kathy Sabota did a great thing where they went around and did autopsy on type one kids and, and non and normal infant deaths, uh, which is sort of old fashioned, good uh, pathologic work. And they showed that the SMN in the motor neurons prenatally much higher uh, in, in wild normal infants who die gets lower, uh, uh, but still pretty high under three months. And after three months, it drops quite dramatically. So there's a very early antenatal postnatal expression of SMN. So this is the punchline here. I'll just, I know I'm galloping along here and I apologize. Oh, and I, uh, I've been stopped. What happened there? Just hang on. Uh, uh, there we go. I, I clicked on the wrong thing. Um, can people still see it? Boop, 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 boop. Sorry. Uh, Okay, so so I, I'm not sure if it is still uh, uh, like this. At any rate, uh, so so it's an incredible. So so this is a motor neuron. This is the axon. This is the incredibly complicated uh, neuromuscular junction. Um, and in order uh, to maintain this neuromuscular junction, there needs to be RNA down here, in order to make the various components. Especially when you're developing the growth cone and setting the neuromuscular junction up. If you look at the structure of SMN, it binds, this is the so-called tutor domain of SMN, it binds to RNA binding proteins, which obviously bind to RNA. So we have a situation where SMN binds, uh, I've, I've discovered animation here, I apologize, binds to RNA binding proteins, which binds to RNA. And um, so my pathophysiologic model, and this is my last slide, it is um, that basically just-in-time protein translation is critical to the establishment and maintenance of the neuromuscular junction very much so early on so this needs as it's finding its way down to the skeletal muscle and setting it up you need rna in the presynaptic area to make those proteins and smn is a critical arbiter of the presynaptic pool and so it's contingent on the presence of this presynaptic pool of rna smn binds uh, made in the nucleus uh, uh, sort of made in the perinuclear region it binds rna binding proteins and it traffics the mrna down to the presynaptic area. Uh, and um, 
as the SMN drops, that presynaptic pool drops and there's neuromuscular uh, dysfunction. And if a motor neuron loses enough of its neuromuscular uh, units, it dies. And this is obviously what we see in, in uh, most in type one, as well as the other um, motor neuron, uh, uh, the other types of SMA. And so it's essentially in this era of the pandemic, a supply chain issue. Uh, uh, a mature, uh, once you come through the fire, a mature neuromuscular junction is much less dependent upon, uh, upon the um, level of SMN. And so the punchline is that uh, at time is of the essence for therapy, which is why this newborn screen is such a beautiful thing. And I will wrap it up there. Thanks very much. Uh, is it over to uh, Kristen now, I think. need to unmute myself. There we go. Okay. Uh, hopefully you can see that okay. Um, okay. So I wanted to uh, thanks Alex and Hugh. Uh, quickly just come back to the genetics of SMA before we talk about how we're actually testing for this. And so Hugh and Alex did a beautiful job of talking about the two genes involved, SMN1 and SMN2. Um, from my perspective, actually wanted to drill down in terms of what is the mutational mechanism that leads to this disease. And this is important because we have to consider this when designing what tests to use if we want to test for this at a DNA level. And so um, we have a number of different mutational mechanisms that we see leading to SMA. And so the first on the left, you can see here, there's just a complete absence of the SMN1 gene. It's been deleted. On the right at the top, you then see, uh, we see gene conversions. Because these genes are so highly homologous, we can get conversions between them such that the functional part of SMN1 at the end that makes that that functional actually turns into the SMN2 sequence. And so as a result here, we've essentially deleted the SMN1 gene. And so between these two, there's no functional SMN1 uh, gene sequences. But the top two, so a full deletion and gene conversion, make up over 99% of the disease variants uh, for SMA. On the bottom, I've also noted that there are rare occasions with point mutations that have been documented. These are loss of function mutations, um, but again, they're quite rare. And so heading into our screening system, uh, the point mutations are actually quite difficult to test for and are not our target. Um, so we are looking for a complete absence of the SMN1 protein. And again, that's justified by the fact that there's over 99% of disease mutations will fall in that category. Okay, so the question that was uh, put to me or the problem is that we need a robust screening assay that can test about 3,000 samples a week, which is about 600 a day. So Newborn Screening Ontario tests between 140 and 150,000 infants a year. Um, and certainly in the realm of genetic testing, that's a much higher throughput than we're used to. And so how can we go about this? And so I'm just gonna walk you through how the testing algorithm works. Um, we have two different assays that are running in the lab at this time. So there's an initial screening assay and then a confirmation assay. Okay. So our initial assay is what's run on all infants. So all 140,000 infants go through this. We're using a technology that's called mass array. And so how this works is um, you have a primer or a DNA sequence, I guess that's uh, homologous to a site of interest, and you're able to add one base as an extension of that. So that one base is added, and we then read that out yeah, based on mass spectrometry, the mass of that. So based on the mass that was added, uh, we can then map out what base was added. And so in setting this up, um, we're able to use, there are two sequence changes that are coding between SMN1 and SMN2. So there's the functional change in exon 7 that we heard about. So you can see here on the right, I have a blue arrow. Um, and for us, our assay overlaps that directly. So the last base of my DNA sequence that binds is that SMN1 change, meaning that if SMN1 is present, that will bind and extend. If SMN1 is not present, it can't bind because it doesn't match the sequence and it won't extend. I'll show you the data in a moment. Uh, the second site, so we have two independent assays that are running, is in the next exon down. And this one actually will read out either. So the DNA sequence binds. And based on what base is added next, we can tell if it's added for SMN1 or SMN2 or both. The other really key thing about this technology that I'll briefly mention is that we can actually multiplex many different sites. And so what we actually do within one well is we're testing for 22 hearing loss variants, uh, two founder variants for SCID genetics, 
and then these two sites for SMA. Okay, so what does the data look like? I just wanted to show an example. So here you see a control, and at the top is the SMN1 exon 7 assay. And so if you recall, our DNA sequence binds. If SMN1 is present, it will extend, and then we see this mass signal peak showing that SMN1 is present. At the bottom is the SMN1 and 2 exon 8 assay, where we see now binding of that sequence, and we've extended both a base that indicates we have SMN1 and SMN2 present. And so this is what a control would look like. We have robust sequence from all sites. If we now look at an SMA patient, at the top, we see that there's no SMN1 signal. So this mass peak is flat, there's nothing there. In the bottom exon 8 assay, we see the same thing for SMN1, and there is a signal peak for SMN2. And so this initial assay is focused on SMN1. SMN2 is there, it's a nice internal control for us, um, but we're looking for the presence or absence of SMN1 in this initial assay. If SMN1 is present at both of those sites, so we have redundancy, samples are reported out as negative. If SMN1 is not detected from either of these, it then proceeds into a confirmation phase. So <clears throat> we have at this point, any samples with SMN1 present reported out as negative. Any samples with SMN1 not present at either or both of those sites will move into a confirmation assay. The assay we're using, I'm not gonna describe in detail because it's what's used diagnostically uh, in Canada and ac across the world. And so it's what's called MLPA or Multiplex Ligation Dependent Programmification. And it's a relative amplification assay. And so we're assessing both the patient samples uh, in relevance to a control. And so we can see this is able to then robustly assess both SMN1 and SMN2 copy number. Again, our mass array assay is just presence or absence. We can't look at copy number. We can now with this second more robust assay. Um, and so here at the bottom left, we can see a control which has two copies of SMN1 and SMN2. As we move to the right, the first middle one here is an SMA patient that has zero copies of SMN1. So at the bottom, you see I have circled and then two copies of SMN2. And then on the far right is a patient with zero copies of SMN1 and four copies of SMN2. And so this is what the confirmation data looks like. It's a much lower throughput assay, but allows us to accurately assess copy number. Okay, so I wanted to kind of just put this then in context in terms of how this works within the lab. Um, I will mention briefly that we report out, so zero copies of SMN1, obviously, and zero to four copies of SMN2. And uh, Pranish, who's following me, will discuss more on that decision um, in terms of we don't report out five or more copies. We haven't had any to date, um, but we report zero to four. So a dried blood spot arrives at NSO. We're then testing for the presence of SMN1. If SMN1 is absent, this moves into the confirm assay where we confirm the absence of SMN1 and assess copy number of SMN2. If uh, this is confirmed, so it's screen positive, at this point the family is contacted and samples get sent very quickly for confirmatory genetic testing. So a sample goes to either two or sick kids who've been really great about turning these around quickly. And so we have some great collaborations where we're giving them a heads up and these samples uh, result to come back very quickly. The, Physicians are also sending a sample in parallel to NSO in the off chance that something is uh, wrong, we can test uh, ID testing within a plate. And so in a screening context, while very infrequent, we always wanna make sure we have no sample mix up. And so if there was an issue within a plate, we have that second sample to resolve that quite quickly. Um, so everything has been concorded to date as expected. And at this point, uh, it moves into the uh, clinical parameters, which Pranish will discuss following. And so I just wanted to end by uh, giving you, I guess, an idea of what it's looked like to date and then one final thought on where we're going from here. So as uh, Hugh mentioned, in January, we launched the pilot and then in July, it was officially added to the screening panel. The testing has been the same since January. Uh, we have tested uh, just over 100, or almost 128,000 infants to date. Um, to give you an idea in terms of the failure rate on the initial assay, 327 of those have been repeated, so it's a repeat rate of 0.26%, which really isn't bad when we're looking at that context of numbers. Um, the vast majority have obviously gone out as negative. We have 92 samples that have been put onto the confirmation assay, 
Um, and there's been five positives identified to date. And so I will just note that of those 92, the five that have gone in as positive uh, were the only five we had identified that we truly thought would be. The rest were put on a confirmation assay as precautionary. Um, and so at this point, um, we're quite happy with how the testing schemes are working. And so the last thing I will uh, mention is that the based on the timing, as everyone has talked about so far, we're really focused on getting this as fast as possible. The MLPA confirm assay is a two-day assay, and certainly there's uh, discussions of ways can we do this faster. And so we're just in the process now of validating a new assay, which is called digital droplet PCR. Um, and it's not widely used in Canada at this point for diagnostics. It is starting to be used in the States. And so we're working on this. And so just really briefly, essentially, it's a really fancy PCR reaction that splits your DNA up into millions of droplets and then assesses the quantity of your sequences of interest within those droplets. And so you have all of these independent measures, which then are read through a fluorescence reader to assess copy number. And so I'll just share with you kind of a couple of brief snippets of the validation data to show it actually works quite well so far. So you can see at the top, SMN1, uh, our controls that were zero, one, and two copies. And then we have a number of samples we had tested. Everything quite nicely lines up. Uh, at the bottom, same thing for SMN2. The data is quite clear uh, in terms of the copy numbers that it's calling. And so that's something we're looking at for the future to run in parallel as well, uh, because it's an assay that only takes a few hours as opposed to two days. And so this would allow us to uh, refer one day earlier and to then get those samples out for diagnostic testing in those infants uh, in earlier. And with that, I will pass it to Pranesh. Hi, everyone. Uh, can someone just give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen? Yep. Okay, perfect. Oh, no, I just lost my screen. Um, there we go. I have this brand new keyboard with a lock uh, key right at the top corner that I keep accidentally hitting. So uh, uh, thanks, uh, everyone before me. And, and one thing I want to mention as well with Kristen, uh, Alex put a note on the chat that Kristen and her team nailed this. And I, I think uh, we'll have to give her kudos for that. Um, and one thing she didn't mention is that for the first several months, we actually ran a parallel uh, quantitative PCR assay as well, just to be 1000% sure that we weren't missing any potential cases by having an orthogonal technology uh, in place. So you always want to have an extremely sensitive uh, approach in your first tier, and you can add specificity with these uh, additional layers of testing. Uh, so I just wanted to call, call that out even a little bit more. So where I want to go with this is uh, you weren't sure which part of this four part presentation to start with first or to end with, uh, but decided to end with uh, some concepts and principles of screening uh, and why we're screening for SMA and some of the issues around there. So I always like to start in comparing screening and contrasting screening versus diagnosis. And in the end, they differ uh, very much in terms of reason and in terms of context. So screening is the systematic population-based application of a test or inquiry to individuals who do not have symptoms of a specific disease or condition in order to identify those who warrant further investigation and or intervention to achieve better outcomes. So screening tests are about an asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic population. It's about risk estimation and it's about changing their outcome. Diagnosis, on the other hand, is the act or process of identifying or determining the nature and cause of a disease or, or injury through evaluation of patient history, examination, review of laboratory data. So diagnostic testing is about a defined symptomatic population. These people are already patients, as opposed to the screening context where they're not patients, confirming or refuting presence of disease and defining an etiology, prognosis, and treatment. So I've already mentioned one big difference. One is we have people who are not patients already, who haven't come with any issues or problems, who uh, are being screened in the screening context versus those who are coming with a, a concern. And the second is prior probability. You're dealing with a, po a population with a much lower prob prior probability generally when you're performing screening versus when you're doing using a diagnostic uh, or doing uh, performing diagnosis. Um, and we're hearing a lot about that in the COVID context, I'll, I'll remind everyone, when we talk about whether or not we should test asymptomatic you know, people, we're really talking about whether we should screen 
versus whether we should try and diagnose someone who's got uh, issues already. So this is a uh, somewhat pithy quote, um, but I think it really does uh, uh, make you think, and, and, and rightly so, about uh, what you are doing when you're screening. So this is from Muir Gray, who's uh, in the UK, one of the authors of this uh, very nicely written book about screening. All screening programs do harm, some do good as well, and of these, some do more good than harm at a reasonable cost. The first task of any public health service is to identify beneficial programs by appraising the evidence. So one way to make sure that screening does good is to ensure that it's occurring within a system of care. In Ontario, several years ago, when we were trying to define screening, that was the definition I presented um, just earlier, uh, we also defined what were the essential elements of a system of care for screening and newborn screening in particular. So one, there need to be mechanisms for educating enrolling, and enrolling the target population, including considerations of consent. Two, the screening test or inquiry itself and its interpretive process, which Kristen has talked about. Three, mechanisms for retrieving individuals identified to be at risk, conducting diagnostic evaluations and initiating treatments or interventions as indicated. Now, a lot of people who don't work in screening often react to this term retrieve. And it's a term that's often used in the screening context to say, you have someone who's been tested who isn't a patient, and now you have to make them a patient. You have to bring them in. You have to retrieve them into the healthcare system. And how you do that and the skills required are, are uh, both uh, important and unique. Four, data management and performance measurement infrastructure to ensure high performance of all components. And lastly, a robust policy setting and governance structure. So think of these in the context of SMA. Um, uh, well, you know, think of uh, the presentations earlier as uh, Kristen's presentation and some of the things I'll point out at the end here. So very nicely, and, and this, it's um, fascinating how this uh, uh, treaty still is extremely relevant and uh, really summarizes the issues uh, beautifully, uh, you know, 52 years later. Um, uh, I was born in 1970, so I can always remember the year. So it's two years older than me. Uh, so Wilson and Youngner uh, for the World Health uh, Organization outlined uh, the fundamental principles of screening. Uh, these are often interpreted as criteria for whether or not a disease or a condition should be uh, an appropriate target of screening. It actually does work relatively well in that way. The criteria themselves, and I'm not going to read through all of them, I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. One is that they focus on issues of the condition, the treatment, the test, and a broad category of acceptability to the population. And it's really on those lines that we organize the policy considerations in Ontario as to whether or not a disease or a condition should be added to the newborn screening panel. I think one other thing I'll highlight while I've got this slide up is that the natural history of the condition, including development from latent to declared disease should be adequately understood. And Hugh has talked already about some of the uh, uh, complexity in the natural history and the prediction of natural history in SMA. And I'll come back to that in the uh, second last slide. So this is just a screenshot of the template we use in the policy consideration in Ontario. And I think Michael uh, Garrity, who is on this uh, in the Zoom audience, um, uh, you know, led the working group that included Hugh and uh, Alex in Ontario when this uh, uh, review was done. And the final uh, decisions are always expressed as uh, uh, in the in the context of the condition, the test, the treatment, and societal considerations, with either no concerns, some concerns, or sufficient concerns that we would recommend against screening in Ontario. How this is organized in terms of a decision-making process is there's an initial nomination, um, and this uh, can happen from anyone, but often involves uh, patient advocacy and support groups uh, and clinical specialists, but can also come from uh, the ministries or an individual. After the nomination, we have a newborn screening Ontario Advisory Council who discusses this at a meeting. And at times, the uh, nominated uh, condition just does not have any face uh, validity for as a um, uh, potential target of screening, and so we can delineate the reasons for that and communicate it back. But if it does have that base validity, it would go on to a very detailed uh, and uh, 
uh, often taking months, if not a couple of years, uh, to do a full review against those parameters with a very um, detailed questionnaire, which we, uh, uh, with uh, very good naming conventions called Forum 3, and that uh, provides the documentation of that discussion. That's then presented and discussed at, for full review at the full uh, Newborn Screening Advisory Council, and a recommendation one way or the other is made to the ministry. If it's a recommendation to start screening, then the final decision rests with government. Uh, and this actually does go all the way up to cabinet in the end. So in terms of the timeline with SMA, it was first nominated in August 2017. At that time, treatment with News and Urson was not uh, available in Canada. In other words, there was not a reimbursement uh, a framework in place as to whether or not the payment would be uh, reimbursed by public payers. And so without uh, access to the transformative therapy, it would there was uh, not a, um, uh, uh, con the context wasn't there to consider it for um, uh, newborn screening. Once that uh, reimbursement framework came into place, the consideration restarted and a recommendation was made uh, in early 2019 with the decision to go ahead towards the end of 2019. The conclusion of the task force and of the full advisory council was to recommend newborn screening for SMA. And this was in large part because of what Hugh presented. There is a treatment available which has been shown to profound, profoundly alter the course of the disease. As well, both published and emerging data suggest that pre-symptomatic treatment results in optimal outcomes. That's very important, that the treatment has to start in uh, a pre-symptomatic phase where someone can't come to you with concerns um, unless you are, have already identified them to achieve optimal outcomes. And the drug is listed through the EAP, so Exceptional Access Program with the Ministry of Health. It is also recommended that the screening program for SMA be evaluated at three years to ensure it is performing as expected with ongoing quality evaluation after this time. Now, in some ways, you might think this was a slam dunk that we, you know, absolutely had to screen for SMA. And, and certainly, you know, um, uh, there's a, a heck of a lot of reasons, uh, you know, that fit those Wilson and Youngner principles uh, very well. But some concerns were also identified. One, the natural history of the treated disease is not known. So once you've treated patients who would have uh, died at a very early age, again, as, as uh, Hugh uh, showed uh, in his presentation, are there going to be any emerging com uh, complications? Is the treatment uh, and the, the response to treatment going to be sustainable uh, as people reach ages uh, with SMA who have never reached uh, those ages before? So that's an area that's not known. Two, does the test, the test does not clearly distinguish between the clinical subtypes, uh, i.e., maybe I'll say sitters, uh, 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 standards, and walkers, um, uh, but SMA type one, two, three, or four, and whether or not to report uh, and re you know, refer all patients regardless of their SMN2 copy number. Third, the two phase three clinical trials assessing using nursing showed significant beneficial effects on mortality and ventilation free survival. However, the long-term improvement in motor functions are less clear. So uh, the, the horizon on which we have data on how well these children will do is still limited. So both studies and an ongoing trial strongly suggest that pre-symptomatic therapy leads to the best clinical outcome. I already talked about that. And then last, news and nursing is extremely expensive and there is no information on how society will view these costs, especially in terms of equity for users of the health system. And so this, uh, you know, uh, is an issue both for health economists, but also as we see in, in public discourse. Uh, you know, there was a news article yesterday in uh, Alberta of a family trying to access uh, uh, um, gene therapy and the, and the very large, you know, high cost and, you know, these many issues of drugs for rare disease and, and high cost uh, uh, drugs. So uh, this is an ongoing conversation. Um, so just a couple more slides. Uh, so I'll just you know, present a little bit about some of these uh, areas of concern. So one, cost effectiveness. Um, this is just a screenshot of the, uh, I'd say the most important table from this very recent publication, I think it was September 2020, uh, looking at the cost effectiveness of news and nursing and, and universal newborn screening for, for SMA. 
Now, remember, this is in the American context where uh, they would not apply the same sort of criteria that our EAP program in Ontario would in terms of who should or could access uh, uh, news and nursing therapy. Uh, so if anything, these costs are at the, the high end because um, uh, their uh, diagnosis-based initiation of treatment often will happen. And so patients will be getting treatment whether they have multiple copies of SMN2 uh, uh, or if, uh, you know, they may have attenuated disease where our EAP criteria may not allow that. But I just want to, I just want to draw attention to these two lines here, just at the top here, where they looked at the cost effectiveness and the incremental cost effectiveness ratio uh, for quality of life here for news and nursing with no screening happening and then news and nursing in the context of screening. Now, the ICER is actually extremely high for publicly funding um, uh, news and nursing, uh, regardless of whether it's in the context of newborn screening or not. But in Ontario, the decision was made to fund newborn screen, uh, to fund, sorry, not newborn screening, but to fund reimbursement for news and nursing uh, earlier. And outside of the context of newborn screening, the cost is almost doubled for um, cost per quality adjusted life uh, year. And the reason for that, you know, in a nutshell is because it doesn't work as well. These kids go on to develop many developmental or motor disabilities if the treatment starts late and may even end up with significant respiratory issues up to and including need for ventilation. So, um, you know, this is very compelling uh, evidence when your society has decided to provide this therapy that it should do so in the context of newborn screening. So the second thing I want to talk about is this, this question of the SMN2 copy number. And Hugh, I stole this uh, from your slide set when you sent it to us yesterday. Uh, but to remind that, you know, we have the SMA type, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, the you know, sitters and the walkers. And, you know, you can look at it from that perspective. What proportion of kids with, say, type 2 SMA have uh, three, two, three, or four copies of SMN2. But when you're doing it the other way around in screening, when you're starting with the asymptomatic population, the data you have at the time is well, how many copies of SMN2 do they have? And so if you take someone with four copies of SMN2, for example, how predictive of that? What's their probability of having a more severe or a more attenuated form of uh, uh, SMA? And so here, if you just look at the SMN2 copies of four, there's about a 90% chance that they will have an attenuated form of SMA. And the evidence is very poor as to whether they should be treated or will benefit from treatment for, from uh, news and nursing. If you look at those with three copies, like the patient that um, um, Hugh presented at the beginning, about 70% of them will develop type one or type two uh, SMA, so a more severe type, and there is extremely, there is very good evidence, as Hugh presented, that early or pre-symptomatic treatment with using nursing will change outcomes. But you still have to remember that about 30% may have developed an attenuated form. And so, uh, you know, this conundrum of, of can you predict natural history, and the best marker we have right now is SMN2 copy number, led us to this decision that if there were patients with four or more copies, they should still be reported and referred. Those patients should be seen because about 10% of them will develop uh, uh, a more severe form of SMA. And with surveillance, uh, you know, they could initiate treatment uh, uh, as early as possible within their course of disease. But also recognizing that there is potential harm from over, of over-treatment uh, where the evidence is unclear as to whether these patients with uh, uh, three copies, for example, who may not have developed early disease uh, will actually develop it. So uh, for those of you who are particularly interested, Hugh did a great job in uh, 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 getting our group to write up what we did here. And so that just came out uh, electronically in the Canadian Journal of Neurological Sciences. Um, and uh, if you ser search for Chakraborty Macmillan, I think this is the only thing that comes up in the uh, in uh, PubMed with the uh, intersection of the two of us. Um, but here again, if you have an SMN2 copy number of less than or equal to three, the big thing here is the initiation of treatment. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but I'm happily pointing away here. 
uh, but you would initiate treatment. With an SMN2 copy number of four, you would enter a close surveillance mode and initiate treatment if the uh, uh, disease progressed to the point where uh, you clearly have onset of uh, motor issues. And as Kristen mentioned, we're only referring those with four or fewer copies. So if it turns out after the diagnostic workup that there's a, the child has five or more, then that is a false positive of the newborn screening system. And uh, um, you know, it may require some quality investigation, including to ensure there wasn't a, a mix up either at the uh, birthing hospital or in the newborn screening lab and that there's another child at risk. So last slide, uh, the experience to date. So we have had five cases identified uh, where this, uh, the diagnosis has been confirmed on the um, uh, second sample. Uh, Hugh's case was case number one here. And uh, there have been three cases with three copies of SMN2, one case with uh, uh, four copies of SMN2. And this child is still doing uh, very well and is in that schedule for surveillance and has not developed any symptoms yet. In case one uh, and case uh, three and case five, uh, treatment was initiated in all cases before, for re uh, before uh, a month of age. Interestingly, in case four, the parents declined uh, uh, treatment. Um, and so I think this is something to always keep in mind is, uh, uh, you know, the decision to go ahead with uh, treatment uh, still is a conversation between the clinician and the parent. And this de declining of treatment has been reported uh, elsewhere, including in a nice publication from a German group. There have been no false positives. Screening has been achieved in a timely way. We're achieving screening and initiation of treatment uh, by about a month of age. There has been some variation in, in um, uh, treatment decisions. The last case, you can see there was a significant gap, a two week gap between the diagnostic labs and the first treatment. And in this case, the parents did have difficulty accepting the diagnosis and also deciding what they wanted to do. The last uh, point I wanna make is, uh, one of the reasons not to uh, refer babies with five or more copies of SMN2 is every time you start screening, so testing an asymptomatic population, you tend to skew the uh, number of people identified with attenuated form of the disease, you tend to skew towards them. You start to um, uh, identify more and more people with those types of uh, 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 less severe forms. Uh, so we might have expected on such a population-based testing that we would see more people with five or more copies of SMN2, but it's really interesting that we haven't. We haven't had a single one yet uh, where they've had an SMN1 deletion and five or more copies of SMN2. And so, um, uh, you know, not sure yet what to make of that, but uh, it uh, uh, may, uh, this kind of data will allow us to uh, Reevaluate and potentially readjust our decisions on what to do with referrals for um, uh, those with multiple copies of SMN2. So with that, I'm going to end off, and I think we still have time for questions. Thank you very much, Pranesh, and to all of our presenters. That was a really fascinating presentation, really an amazing story. Uh, Pranesh, you left us with about one minute for questions. Yes. <laughs> Before we turn over to questions, though, I wondered if you could make, um, let us know about an announcement that's coming out today. Oh, right. Um, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll ask you to present that. Uh, Chio's doing a, um, um, uh, news conference today highlighting uh, Hugh's uh, first patient, so actually case one here, uh, and the parents and the baby will be part of that, uh, uh, you know, um, news conference today. Okay. Thank That's you. at noon. Yeah. We'll look up for that. Um, there is one question in the chat. Um, what is access to therapy like across the province for screening? Are there any geographic funding provider or other barriers? Across the province of Ontario, um, it's quite homogeneous. Um, I can say that uh, Nusinersen, which is the one approved therapy by Health Canada, is covered under the exceptional access program of all but one Canadian province. So there's one Canadian province where it's not available through public funders, but it is available in, the, in all others. Great, thank you. Uh, question from Michael Garrity, or maybe a comment. Go ahead, Michael. 
possibly on mute. Maybe Michael, are you on? Are you muted, Michael? We, we know he's not shy. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. There you go. And um, so I guess this is for Hugh and Alex. Um, is there any information on the long-term uh, cognitive outcome of the treated children and can we expect problems or not? The longest data we have for mm -hmm. children that have been treated is um, in the range of about six, seven years. So there's children that were treated as part of the initial nurture study that are now six, seven years of age approximately, and other children that have been treated with um, omnisemnogene abelparvivec in clinical trials that are now almost six years out. What I can say in very general terms for SMA is we're starting to recognize that there, there may be multiple systems involved, most particularly the liver. There's some um, there's emerging evidence from Rashmi Kothari's group here in Ottawa that they may have some impairment of a normal fatty acid oxidation, for example, but um, the CNS, um, the central nervous system is generally spared in, in SMA. These children are typically uh, normal to above normal intelligence, and there's no signals that have emerged from either of the tr uh, therapies that have been used in clinical trial to suggest that there's any adverse effects to the central nervous system associated with those therapies. And Alex, feel free to comment in addition. No, no, you... absolutely. Every, 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 it's, it's expressed throughout the body. Everywhere you look, there's soft anomalies, in it, in, especially in the more uh, severe SMA. But surprisingly, the other neurons are not impacted, and it doesn't look like these therapies are going to impact the other neurons. Yep. Okay, we have one more question from the, uh, the chat. Um, do we know if any cases of SMA were diagnosed over the last year in Ontario who were NSO screened negative? Yeah, so we're not aware of any. Sorry, we're not aware of any cases of um, you know symptomatically diagnosed uh, individuals who had an SN1 deletion. And I saw there was another question on the chat, which ties into that. I think one thing to remember is that we're only testing for the SMN1 deletion type of SMA. So there, you can still get some cases, a very small proportion, but they exist. So if you think that a child may have SMA, it's still very important to get them referred to you. Uh, or to a neuromuscular specialist and to consider the diagnosis because it's about 95% that will be the, right. due to the deletion, but not all. Although I'd have to say globally, we haven't seen it either. Uh, although I'm not sure how hard people are looking, but it, it, it hasn't been um, reported that I'm aware of. I would add that we need to keep yep. this on our radar. So if children yep. are presenting with isolated gross motor yes. weakness, we yes. have to think about it immediately. SMA. There's good data to, to show that children with type 2 or type 3 SMA, the delay from symptom onset to diagnosis on average is a year. And it's not unusual for me to see children that can have several years delay because this is painless weakness that these children present with. Good point. Good final point. Yes, great. Thank you very much. We are at time, so I'm going to have to end it here. Uh, really fantastic work and really very interesting presentation and discussion. Thank you all.